and we are live. Hi everybody, this is Richard Barker, the Incredible Hypnotist. Um, I thought I would uh, do a Facebook Live, just uh, live into the group, just to discuss white coat syndrome and uh, just to sort of backtrack the way it came about. I had a, a lady that's approached me um, as, a, as a potential online client that has uh, indicated to me, and, and I guess this might be some of the reasons why in fact she, she has this sort of issue in the first place. She, she's seen multiple hypnotists for white coat syndrome. Um, it has not worked in her eyes for whatever reason. You know, she's still scared to go uh, to see doctors, nurses, uh, anything in a medical sort of capacity. And um, so it got me thinking, I, you know, I've been around hypnosis quite a while, but I don't really know what white coat is. So I started to do some research. I, um, I asked the question within the Facebook group. Uh, Scott McFall answered, as did a bunch of other hypnotists. But there were also quite a few people that, that indicated that they didn't know what it was either. But then there was a few people that said, look, this is actually pretty common. It's, pre you know, it's quite a common sort of situation. I've, I've never run into it before. So um, Scott McFall was um, polite enough to be able to, um, he was going, we were going to just hop on a phone call and um, discuss it. And I thought, well, you know, the learning would be better actually, rather than me just get the wisdom first, you know, first hand and then go ahead and, and do the session. It might be actually prudent to, for us all to learn, you know, from someone that's been in the game a, a very long time and just kind of learn the approach to it. And I'm sure there's going to be different variants. I'm sure we've all got our own sort of opinions on what to do and how to do it. But since Scott had offered to jump on a call with me, I thought we might as well uh, do it live and actually um, get it to the point that other people can also see it. So we are live. Uh, this is not pre-recorded. This is not rehearsed. Uh, what you see is, is basically what you get. Um, and so uh, Scott is on the line right now. How are you doing, my brother? You are now live on the um, internet on Facebook. Good to see you, Richard. How are you doing? Good to see you, my friend. So um, obviously you and I, you know, we've been discussing a little bit about this white coat syndrome and, um, you know, you, you, you kind of schooled me a little bit on, uh, on, on what it is and what it isn't and, and just some of the sort of ideas that you personally have experienced yourself. So for those that don't know you, you're not like really sort of vocal inside the groups I've noticed other than your own private ones. Just give people a little bit of a, those that don't really know you, just a, a quick sort of background as to, you know, your world of hypnotism or hypnosis. Sure. Um, my grandparents were students of Harry Aaron's and um, my family's been in alternative care since the 1940s. Um, I had a chain of clinics in the Midwest uh, from the 1980s uh, on and saw many thousands of clients in the locations that I had. And they were in Bismarck, Fargo, Minot, Sioux Falls, and Denver, most, mostly. Then I developed a training company that consults for a lot of hypnotists internationally. Uh, I also did stage hypnosis, uh, toured, uh, did a lot of that sort of thing. Uh, but we did a lot of white coat cases over the years, a lot of anxiety cases in general. So I thought I would just explain the approach we use, you know. And uh, there are other ways to do it, of course. But I'll let you know how we approach it. Is, is this something you get a lot of requests for? I mean, is it fairly... I heard someone say it was quite common. Yeah. Um, the, the thing that I got the most was people afraid of the dentist. Oh, really? And, and then it would be the white coat thing would be second. Huh. Uh, yeah, but the dentist thing is more common by far. And so I had a lot of referring dentists who would have people who really needed the work who were constantly missing their appointments. Yeah, and then then I started sending letters to the physicians, and then we started having referring physicians. But the dentist started the process in the professional setting. I myself got into it, Richard, uh, on this particular subject because when I was a little boy, I had all those heart surgeries and whatnot. Was born premature, and I got quite a fear because of back then. You know, they'd have to get blood gases, and they'd yeah. have to run the knee into your uh, wrist through the bones and get, you know arterial blood gases to check. And I got to tell you, it was a nightmare because they missed one time 13 times. Oh, wow. So 13 times, and it's a particularly painful stick. They don't do that anymore. But I would eventually, as a child, be quite paranoid about going to get the stuff, the checkups and so forth. And so my blood pressure would go up naturally. The, 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 the real clinical point, Richard, of white coat syndrome 
is that the blood pressure goes up just because of the anxiety of being at the doctor's office. So the, 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 like the Wikipedia version of this would be blood pressure change, hypertension because of fear of the doctor. OK, but then there's just the anxiety or not going or getting all jacked up or, you know, refusing appointments and so on. Right. Mm. Um, so I'm hearing the ticking of my laundry in the background. But, but uh, talk to me about the know, hyper, the hypertension. Then is that does that go hand in hand? Because we get people contact us for hypertension. Is, is that like one of the is it similar or is it is that tied into white coat or is that you can have that on it on its own? You can have an increase in blood pressure, right? Oh, of course, you can have blood pressure problems without anxiety for many reasons. Uh, you know, we're not physicians per se. So but but obviously there are a lot of reasons to have high blood pressure. But white coat syndrome means that the anxiety and the tensing up around the anxiety and the heart rate changes and, you know, the cortisol and adrenaline you know, is jacking them up so that getting a real reading can be difficult and so forth. The testing can be difficult and so forth. Right. Uh, yeah. All right. So you, you've had like firsthand experience with, uh, you know, with the heart surgery and, um, you know, the, 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 the issue yourself of the anxiety. And mm -hmm. uh, so how did you how did you start to learn how to uh, I don't I don't like using the word treat it. So, but what how did you learn how to sort of um, work with it, for want of a better term? Personally, what got me into hypnosis was when I was 11 at the St. Mary's Hospital at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And I talk about this a lot for the pain management side of it, but they had to make it so that I was comfortable getting the blood draws, getting the tests. And the nurses were relatively well-trained in various forms of hypnosis, waking hypnosis, and what we'll call distraction strategies to change your state of mind or to make you have fun or to have it be uh, no big deal. And, and of course, they do so many of them that they had to get good at it. And so I knew what it was to be a child terrified of this sort of thing and then have the nurses do techniques, relax me, uh, set up the counting type inductions as they were doing procedures and changing my expectations so that that fear would go down. So first, it, that's wonderful because then you can believe it works because it's worked for you. You know, that's the idea. Mm -hmm. But uh, then when people start coming in, you know, there's a formal process that we kind of go through. Um, and, I, you know, I don't know if we want to talk about that right away, but the, the beginning when somebody comes in for this, the very first thing you want to do is pretend that you're a student and their job is to teach you how to have the problem. And so you're going to they're going to say, well, it just happens to me. And you're going to say, well, OK, so pretend your job is to teach me. What do you see in your head first? What do you yeah. feel in your emotions? How do you what do you hear as you go through this? Does your body tense or loosen? And you're going to go through sight, sound and touch and the characteristics of sight, sound and touch as you ask these questions. And you're going to have them teach you and you're going to get them serious enough about teaching you or joking around about asking questions until they're really describing their senses and the series of events that happen to lead up to the anxiety. As they're teaching this to you, um, you're going to be agreeing with the positive intentions of what they're teaching. You. And you're going to be pointing out that if you do the same series of stages of steps, you feel the same state of mind that, yep, I'll be, I'll be darned. If I do the same series of things, I assume the same things. I see the same things you're saying. It turns out my feelings jack into this anxiety as well. Hmm. Right. So that you're going to be eliciting the strategy of how this, what is essentially a, almost like a phobia. It certainly is an anchor, you know, yeah. or a stimulus that causes this. So you're just going to basically bait them into beginning to, instead of just thinking of it happening to them, you're actually deconstructing the steps they go through to end up in this mood. Okay. So, so as a, so as a re, let's just get this right in my mind. So for example, this, this client that approached me, we're going to do this over zoom. And mm -hmm. obviously there's a, there's a pre intake process that's taken place. You know, every, everyone, pretty much does this, I think, you know, around, around the, the world now. And so this is a, this is a conversation about that client teaching me about what it is. Is that, am I seeing this right? Well, look at it like this. Let's contrast it with, let's say analysis or Freud. I don't care where it came from. 
as much as I care how they're doing it. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, so what do they see? How do they see it? What do they feel? How do they feel it? What do they hear? How do they hear it as it's taking place? Now, that's very different than when did this start? You follow me? Right. Um, so a lot of people are trying to, let's say, elicit a strategy, but the questions they ask are more like a counselor than a hypnotist or a neurolinguist. So remember that we're assuming there's a series of steps that have to happen in order to end up in the mood that we want them to change. And we want them to discover those steps, like almost like they've stepped out of themselves and are watching it from an objective position Yeah. as we're doing this. So they're, when they're teaching us, that's what's happening. They're beginning to be able to, to perceive the steps in the strategy. Because they probably were never aware of that anyway, right? You'd, we're creating an increased awareness of what their sort of steps to their anxiety is. Is that right? Yeah. Think about somebody who's afraid of spiders. Mm-hmm. You know, teach me how to have the problem. Well, I'll say, well, it just happens. It just happens to me. Ooh, you know, and then you say, yeah. well, well, what, what do you see first? Do you imagine them crawling on you? What do you feel in your body? Is it tight or loose? Is it fast or slow? Is it bright or dim? Huh. Do you see movement or is it a still picture? And the whole point of it is you're, you're just kind of pulling out of them the sensory experience that they're having instead of them thinking, how come I can't change this? Yeah. So they're asking the wrong question, but they don't know that. So when you start to have them give you this strategy, you're implying that it could be different. Hmm. And when you go from there, you start agreeing with the positive intention of the behavior. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be bit either by that spider. Right, right. Well, in, in the medical thing, you know, you begin to say, hey, yeah. Um, so maybe the secondary benefit is that they're martyring themselves, that they're really good at helping others or teaching others. But when they're going to receive help, maybe part of that anxiety is that they feel like receiving help makes them less than other people. So maybe when they're focused on others, they're really giving. And when they focus on themselves, maybe they're martyred and it becomes very dramatic. You know, the kind of the woe is me part of it. Yeah. Certainly that was hard to get over for me as a pediatric patient, you know, because you can get everybody else giving you sympathy, which feels like love. Hmm. So the problem is that the, the scenario around these problems is it takes pressure off of you. People let you get away with not doing your responsibilities if you're not feeling well, or you let yourself get away with stuff when you're not feeling well. So There's all kinds of secondary benefit. Maybe it's just avoiding the stress of being at the appointment. Maybe they don't want to face whichever illness they need to heal from. Maybe they don't want to change a lifestyle. But remember that it's not as simple as white coats make me stressed. Yeah. Okay. So as you're having them teach the story, you're noticing what's the secondary benefit of this behavior. Does it bring people closer to them? Does it get them to avoid work they don't want to do? And remember, they're not going to totally consciously know what that is. Right. Not they're going to know a little, but none of us know completely the exact way we're playing that game, do we? And it's interesting how they self-diagnosed and used the term white coat. Notice. Yeah. Well, that's interesting, Richard. But but that's because nowadays we all think we're brilliant diagnosticians because <laughs> yeah. we have, we have Google right. or we have whatever way we have a search engine. And so people are. People are much more difficult patients than they've ever been, you know, in reality. But but as we as we begin to then have them teaching us, sometimes you got to say, watch yourself on a movie screen, kind of like phobia theater and NLP. And have them teaching you like they're watching it on a movie screen so that you can begin to build as you perhaps blur that picture or change it after they teach you or speed it up and have the film break or whatever way you begin to change what they're picturing and change what they're feeling. Then you want to ask them if this went perfect, how do you want it to be different? Oh, I like that. You know, and if it went great, how do you want it to be different? What would it look like on the screen? What would you feel? How would you want it to be different? And as they're building that you can watch their body because you can see in their body language, if they think it's possible or they're actually thinking it's impossible. So during that time, you might have to you might have to ask them, you know, what prevents that or you know, what would have to be true for you to go ahead and let that happen. 
So you're setting up both the sensory experience of what it's going to be like, the, you know, the evidence or what they're going to see to, to know that that process is gone as you do the techniques. But you're also taking responsibility for the fact that they might be debating it. They might have a belief that it's not possible. Uh. So the woman that you're going to see, because she's seen a lot of people, she wants to be right. She wants yeah. to be right. And the problem that you've got is that you have to make her right while she's changing because she doesn't want to be told what to do. So she has a honeymoon phase, an irritation phase, and an it didn't work phase with all of these people. Well, when you're doing the intake with a person who's seen a lot of hypnotists and they love to pull this, clients love to say, I went to 15 people and finally you're the one. <laughs> right. I, mean, I must have heard that from a thousand people in my life. So you got to remember that. This is a this is probably the set of steps they said to the last one that they flipped on later. Right. So you've got to create, in my opinion, a very unique experience in the intake where they've taken responsibility for their behavior in a new way, where they're thinking it's something they're doing instead of something that's happening to them. Something they're doing mm. through a series of reactions automatically instead of something that's happening to them. Now this this is uh and it needs to happen sort of as an accident of the conversation. You can't just accuse them. That would but a valid, a valid question is just that. And I, and I do ask that. I, I do ask somewhat accusing questions because it provokes a response. So I do find myself asking, and that's one of the strategies here is, yes, you know, that's a good strategy. What are you thing, doing that's, uh, that, that's, first of all, assisting this, and second of all, preventing this? Right. What, what are you doing? That, right. And that's really good. Um, the hard part is if you provoke a response, you also have to be really good at backtracking or making sure you get the rapport back mm. so that you have mutual self-interest as you're going through the techniques. A lot of people, they're so interested in being liked that they won't provoke an honest response from a client. Right, right. But it's good. Obviously, it's great that you know, you're comfortable with that. But I'm just kind of looking at a list. Then if you want to read NLP techniques, I mean, we're not going to sit and break them down entirely in this conversation, but phobia theater and or swish pattern um, can be really good. And so can, if you anchor the phobia and then anchor five or 10 things that are, they're really good at or really positive on the other hand, until the positive hand is many times more leveraged than the phobia. You can also use visual squash to try to pop this feeling away. But the, the intake that teach me how to have the problem and getting a valid sight, sound, and touch strategy that they're talking about and asking them questions until that's real, then beginning to switch that in the way that they're seeing what would the outcome look like, what would it feel like, so that it's not, they're not asking questions, how come I'm going through this, how come I can't get over this, but rather you're not in the language part of the brain anymore in the intake, you're in the visual part, the auditory part, and the kinesthetic part, rather than the linguistic part of the brain, which can only think forensically or label stuff. Uh -huh. They're going to fantasize a new outcome. It's going to have to be visual. It's not, you know, you persuade later. Okay. So as you access that resourceful state, what's it like if they get over it? A lot of the time in that phase, I'm talking about, did you believe in Santa when you were a kid? When did you find out Santa was fake? Do you remember, you know, when you didn't know how to ride a bike and you learned how to ride a bike you didn't know how to forget how to ride a bike. So is it okay if you learn that it turns out that fear was sort of unnecessary, you could let it go? You know, I remember when I was a kid and I used to be in the dark at night when I went to bed and I would think, oh gee, is that a monster in the corner? And I'd get worried about it and pull the covers over mm -hmm. my head. And then I'd pull the covers off of me and, and sneak over and turn the light on and it would be a sweater over a chair or something. And be like, oh geez, you know. Mm -hmm. so, you know, that really happens that you can get over a phobia in that way where you find out, yeah, your nervous system was trying to do you a favor. And now that you know the truth, you're comfortable with medical treatment in a mm -hmm. different way. So as you're doing this intake, you'll notice that I went through a series, afraid, really believing the fear, discovery, letting go of the fear. That's a, mm -hmm. that's a loop, right? That I'm, that I'm building in the story. So as you do all of this intake, then you go into asking them if they're self-conscious about the nudity that has to happen at the doctor. That's another secondary gain, trying to avoid the nudity. Sometimes it's fear of the procedure itself, fear of finding out a condition. 
But what I really want you to see is that sometimes it really is. They just don't want to be disrobed in front of an almost stranger. Yeah. Sometimes. So we can't say it's just medicine or it's just getting shots or it's just the coat. You can see that we've got to ask questions and get them to kind of put their hidden agenda on the table during the intake. Just kind of by accident, they see, oh, yeah, I see the secondary. Uh -huh. And then you agree with it. Yeah, if I felt that way, I'd want to avoid that feeling, too. You want to agree 100% with whatever was driving this. Uh -huh. You don't want to conflict with it at all. You want to just absolutely accept it. So talk me through, we've done the intake. It sounds like you're, you're, you know, you're, you're drawing from a lot of NLP experience you know, in, your, in your questioning technique to some capacity, right? I am. Um, I am. To, to leverage the session. Um, you're kind of establishing, I'm just looking at some notes here, you're kind of establishing hidden factors that could potentially impact whether or not, you know, they, they can let go, uh, you know, with the disrobing. I didn't think of that, but you, you're absolutely right, you know, that, I'm, you know, people don't want to, you know, the, the fear of, you know, laying down and taking your clothes off in front of a stranger. I mean, even though they've probably seen thousands and thousands of people, it's still, it's still intimidating. Um, give us some examples uh, practically how you would prove sort of the hypnosis uh, f for more leverage in the session, you know, and what, what are some of the, so now you've done the intake, what, what then, obviously you've got to prove to the client that what you're doing is hypnosis, right? Right, so as we're, as we're doing the game we're playing, another way to look at it rather than NLP is, you know, I'm really having conversations that are very similar to Erickson directly, in like my voice will go with you, the, the metaphors, the questioning, and and really fall in love with the sensory based deal. So they're all of a sudden they're getting more and more waking hypnosis happening as you're matching their breath rate and and bringing them with you and you're taking them into their senses instead of logistics. So now their brain is sorting by perception rather than labeling. As they're in perception, then I'm usually going to do eye catalepsy mm -hmm. and or hand clasp, but I'm. I'm going to say, we're going to do a little test to find out how well you pay attention. This won't hypnotize you in your chair yet. And I just want you to follow along so I can discover how well you pay attention to me. And so as we're doing that, we'll go into, you know, an eye catalepsy or hand clasp. And then, but remember that while we're doing the teaching, the whole time we're talking during all these sensory based stories, that whole time we're increasing their emotional suggestibility, aren't mm -hmm. we? Yep. We're getting more emotionally valid. They're dropping their guard and we're helping them to be associated in the experience, which is making them emotionally more highly suggestible. As they do that, of course, the conversation is also sort of a long yes set where they're agreeing in a yes set. As that takes place, when they're emotionally valid that whole time in certain ways, you watch them and make sure to keep asking the same basic questions until they're legitimately emotionally congruent. Uh, you can see that their, their body language and their face matches their words. Uh -huh. Once they're there, then you know they're emotionally more suggestible. Then you're going to do the physical suggestibility stuff like the eye catalepsy or hand clasp. Now, the way that you want to do that in the beginning is make sure to use every gimmick to help it work because it's just like Al Krasner said, it's a convincer, not a test. Uh -huh. The idea that we call them depth tests is is actually ludicrous. I'll I like the, I like I like the word convincer, and I, I I don't call them tests either. They are convincers. That's right. It, so what definitely. you're doing with the physical and emotional tests that you're doing, or the convincers, is you're multiplying the likelihood of the next suggestion working. That's the whole point. Of it. Mm -hmm. And there is no other point to it. Uh, so when when you're doing the eye catalepsy or the hand clasp. At the end of it, when they've had success, the embedded commands right there are incredibly important. The suggestions that happen right after it. You, that's interesting, isn't it? Get them to say wow or get them to say yes and get them to emotionally respond with a big deal after the test. And then say, that tells me that you, you are following with your autonomic nervous system. You're breathing now, aren't you? And you're not sitting there thinking, I've got to remember to breathe. That part of you is the part of you that's going to help you let go of that fear now. Uh -huh. as you know do you want and then right there I will say do you want the help it's very general do you want the help 
and then watch them. And until that answer is 100%, uh, what we'll call a surrendered yes, you stay right there after that death test. So they're surrendering into dropping debate with themselves. So now you've got them single-minded and congruent before you go into any hypnosis session or technique. So they've had the eye stuck or they've had the hand clasp work. Remember the gimmick of the eye catalepsy is that the eyeballs are rolled up. If they aren't rolling their eyeballs up, talk about looking through their forehead or looking above their eyebrows. Do something to make sure that their eyebrows, their eyeballs roll up correctly. If you're doing the hand clasp, one of the gimmicks of it is when their thumbs are pressing down very hard, the, the harder the thumbs are pressing down, the harder it is to open the fingers. So if you're not getting the thumbs pushing down hard enough, it's going to be easier for them you know, to pull their hands apart. Also, there's the elbow straight idea. There's the thumbs hard on the index finger idea. Or there's the inverted pushing out idea where when you're pushing out, it's hard to pull the arms apart. But remember that each waking suggestion has a physical reason it's working. And make sure that you've said to them, all hypnosis is self-hypnosis. A hypnotist is just teaching you through it. Don't let them think something's happening to them. With the hypnosis, make sure they know they're doing it. Now, this, this idea then backtracks to the phobia itself. Because we're showing them that it's not happening to them, that it's a series of actions their nervous system was doing. So then we can go into the session. And in the session, you first match and pace. I know that you used to go through tension whenever you thought of a doctor or a lab coat and you felt that pressure. And now you know you can let go of that problem by saying yes, by saying yes, by saying yes to, and then go into the imagery of how you want the evidence to work and match what they said in the intake, match yeah. exactly the evidence they asked for in the intake. So you deepen the emotion in the suggestion during the session as you do progressive relaxation or a yes set like an Elman. And as you, as you do it, you want to fractionalize a lot in this type of thing. So have them go through a door, which leads to another door, which leads to another door. As they go through each door, they're more relaxed or more safe or down the steps or whatever fractionalization you're doing. But it's very important to remember that their response let's say automatically or blindly to the suggestion in their nervous system is going to be directly related to how many layers of letting go you've talked them through. You know, at the end of a stage show, having complied with all of those suggestions all through the show, people are more hypnotized than they are. Let's say if there is such a thing as more hypnotized than they are in an office, because frequently we don't put them through that many compliance exercises in the office, do we? Right, right. So when you're working on these white coat people, just remember that you want to do a lot of, you know, feeling their body pressing into the chair. The idea of increased saliva flow as they relax and swallowing, the concept of their eyes stuck shut, the, the lack of voluntary movement, tingling in the hands and feet. But you want to use as many physical double binds as possible, arm catalepsy, and, letting, and, and when they, you touch the arm, tying the surrender of the anxiety to when their arm hits the chair, for example, you know, mm -hmm. but, but the point of most hypnotists is they like to say things that wreck the power of the session, Richard, this is just relaxing. Don't worry about it. It's just relaxing. <laughs> I, I pay on you, you know, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a terrible thing to say. And so as you go through this, then you're going to talk about the healing and the fitness, and you're going to put them in gratitude. Maybe the state of mind they're in instead of anxiety is gratitude. But we have to, success is not the absence of the fear. Right. Success is what state of mind you want them to have at the end of it. What state do we want them to have? Maybe it's gratitude. Maybe it's uh, feeling constructive, like they're learning something. Maybe it's imagining fitness and healing. So, so would liberated be one? Liberated in the fact that they no longer have, you know, the, the, the fear that they came with? Would that be one? Yeah, the absent. Well, yeah, but liberated still, it's still like getting out of a cell where the cell's unlocked. Yes. Yeah. So it's still away from pain. And we're, what, what we're looking at is we've got away from the problem in the beginning. Then we've got making sure that that's happening. But then we've got to have toward something. Yeah. Like, like if you're leaving one town to drive to another, what town are you driving to? Yeah. And the question is, what mood is that? Maybe it's gratitude. Maybe it's calmness. 
Maybe it's um, feeling like discovery and learning and enthusiasm. But we need some state of mind at the end that's the target yeah. state. And I see a lot of hypnotists thinking that quitting smoking is about quitting smoking. It's really not. It's about what do you do when you're stressed or bored instead? It's what's the target? Mm -hmm. You know, there is a quick question, uh, actually, Scott, from James Harley, who says, uh, would you advocate the six step? Uh, sorry, would you advocate six step reframe? I would. But the way that I talk about six step is. uh I want you to think of it like three-step. The good thing about six-step classically is that you use the feelings in their body for the yes and no signals instead of finger signals, which are not as good. Yeah. The most important thing to learn from classic six-step is the idea that you're asking them, as you ask yourself, if it's okay to let go of and have a new way of accomplishing that goal. Like, You give them three options in six-step for... Uh, the solution, you know, what are the three ways you deal with this differently, you know, and they don't have to come up with them consciously. What you're looking for in six step, which is really great when they react to the suggestions, you say, now, do you have any feelings in your body, tingling, pressure, any feeling in your tummy, your neck, your shoulders, your hands, and maybe they'll tell you a feeling. And then you say, if that's a yes response, ask your uh -huh. subconscious, make it more intense. Well, that idea is really great. It really is that mind body, that abstract taking of their reaction and, and helping them to interpret it as a yes or a no response is really slick. The thing is, um, they might say, I don't feel anything. Then, and then say, if that's a yes response, ask your subconscious mind to make you twice as relaxed. But the thing about six step is it really becomes three step or it becomes a step because it's just agreeing with the positive intention of what's going on and setting up a physical response as meaning something and making sure they have more responses than usual. It also includes the idea of making sure that their change fits into their life with their relationships or their friends or themselves at the end. But, and, and really, the conversation we're having, the guy that, is, was it James that asked that? You know, yeah. James, is, James is astute in the sense that a lot of the language I'm using is, is either very close to or the same as that kind of formal reframe. It is. So that's true. Okay. Um, so we've we've done the you know we've done this the the the, the pre session the session to the point of having the client think about their outcomes you know a, a, an altered state of mind right um, whether whether that's discovery um, so is there any is there anything else example wise that you can I guess I guess the only way that we would know that this would work from a client's perspective is now they go to a medical facility, doctor. Is there any other sort of advice you've got for how to test and prove? They have to know it worked before they get out of the chair. That's mm -hmm. very important. You've got to make sure that their evidence is not, I'll wait and see. Yeah. So when you start the conversation and you're having them teach you how to have the problem, They'll go into the mood and you can point it out to them that as they're thinking about it and fantasizing about it, they have the fear happen right there in the office to some degree. So you can feel what that's like. Yes. As they do that, at the end of the session, you go, go ahead and do your best. Really try to reproduce that problem. Yeah. Do everything you can to feel that way and tell me what happens. It is extremely important at the end of that session that they cannot reproduce it. And they either go into confusion or they go into a different mood. And you need to test and retest that until they are solidly convinced that it feels different right then. And, and you basically have them state that. And they say, so what you're saying is the harder you try, the more it just goes away. That's right. You know, so you're, you're also double binding their initial response where they can't find the fear anymore. And they need to know that before they stand up. And you need to say, is it all right if you feel that forever plus one day, regardless of which kind of treatment you need forever plus one day that you feel really good about your cooperation with your yada, 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 whatever it is, mm -hmm. right? But uh, what you just asked a really astute question that happens with a lot of hypnotists where the person leaves and they're going to wait and see if, right? And wait if blah, blah, blah happened. That's a catastrophe. <laughs> and so... You know, it, it's it's difficult to train people to 
don't leave your client waiting and seeing. Make sure that they have had an like that they've gone, holy smokes, I can't have it the same way anymore. And th this is extremely important. Success is not that they like going to the doctor. Success is that it feels kind of like everybody else feels going to the doctor. Their brain thinks they're supposed to like it. Success getting over a fear of spiders is not that you like spiders. You don't have to like it. And, and this is something that even people that were doing this before I happened to be alive was were aware of. But your client is thinking success is that they would like it. There's an accidental idea, a false premise in the brain that going from phobia is supposed to go to desire or something. And that's crazy. So make sure that you point out that success is being relatively neutral overall. It's not loving it. Does that mm. make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, is, there, is there any, I'm, I, I'm, I'm totally understanding, totally on, 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 on the page as it were. Is there anything else, Scott, that you, you can think of that um, would be beneficial for, for treating uh, the, the, the white coat? I hate to call something a syndrome, but the, the white coat. Um, Two other things I can client. think of, Rich. Yeah, the first thing is when I talked about all the reasons they might have the fear, what I'm trying to do is keep the hypnotist from projecting why they would. I'm trying to get rid of the projection and the hypnotist. Say that one but more time, sorry. Just repeat when that. We when we talked about like if maybe it's fear of nudity or maybe it's fear of mm -hmm. pain that they're in the past or whatever it is, right? Uh, fear of loss of control or needing help instead of giving help, all of those various things. As the, as the hypnotist, you have whichever one you might have and you'll project yeah. that. You have to be so <laughs> curious. Um, and the other thing I would mention, um, oh, I just lost my train of thought on this, but I, I would mention that it can be true that Paranoid schizophrenics can come in, and this can be a presenting system or sim symptom where they really need to be referred out to a different kind of therapist. Yeah. There are people who, where this is a symptom of a much bigger problem. So remember, some people come in, and it really is just this, the, the fear of that doctor or the fear of the, the situation. But keep in mind that this can also be a, a, a part of a much bigger issue. So remember to watch and... You know, if you've been taught to screen for other mental health issues, you know, watch long enough to know whether it's in your scope of practice or you need to refer them to someone else. Hmm. Because it, it doesn't always present as all by itself, Richard. Right, right. Yeah. So I don't know. You know, I know that you're very well trained and we're in law enforcement. I mean, so you went through a ton of watching people. So you know what the nonverbals look like and people who are off because mm -hmm. you had to do them your job. Yeah. But most yeah, you know, to, to, to me, verbal and nonverbal cues are, are huge for my sessions, especially the nonverbal. Um, and just their whole demeanor from start to finish is something I, I, always, I always pay attention to. And uh, a lot of the time, you know, silence is golden. I just let them do the talking and let them spew their guts out so that I can get more information because information is obviously powerful in any session and then reframe and redirect um, which I think we're all reasonably accustomed to. I like your, I like your uh, verbiage and I like, I like the tips that you've given and I like the fact that you're asking them to direct you as to what to do, how it feels like, what they experience. It's more sort of um, client-based as opposed to hypnotist-based, right? It's almost like Aikido, letting the energy go right by you instead yeah. of aiming at each other. It's, it's why you want to sit 45 degrees off instead of directly at them and so on. Yeah. Um, but th that is the, the way that we did that in the beginning is classic strategies elicitation from NLP, but it's done with a more uh, loosey-goosey. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not yeah. formal. It's, it's loosey-goosey so that you can actually be in it. So, yes, it's true that the premises are from some standard techniques. Yeah. What I'm just trying to demonstrate is it's much more, uh, I don't know, folksy, less clinical. Mm. Even though we've used a lot of terms describing it, I wouldn't use those terms with a client. I think that's true in a lot of cases, too. The more informal, the better it is. Like when you're on a stage, the more you just chat to the audience with an unrehearsed patter script, with an unrehearsed mm -hmm. pre-talk, the better the show normally is because it's more informal and more conversational than sort of a rehearsed, I have to say this at this time and that at that time. And that's what a lot of people, I think, in general, they get hung up over that, that 
if you look at some you know quality hypnosis shows or TED talks and things like that, it just feels like they're in your living room having a chat and a discussion. And by the way, of course, there's a strategy behind it all, but it's it's somewhat disguised. And I think that's mm -hmm. what you're saying with this session, you know, the more sort of informal. But even though you're collecting your antennas up, you know, your radars on and you're listening to what they say so that that can help create solutions. Right. For right. them. Yeah. The, the one other tip. Yes, I think that's all exactly right. Uh, the one other tip I would mention is that when you're talking to them, you got to stay on whichever step you're on until they are legitimately 100% surrendered into the emotional point. Mm. What I see folks doing is they're looking at the clock, they know they've got the next client or the next Zoom appointment, yeah. you know, and, and they're, they're bored themselves because they've had this conversation a million times or whatever. So I mean, like you gotta hang right where they are until they're really 100% with you and surrendered into that, that phase. You can't just go through the steps and assume they're getting it might take five laps on one point, mm. you know, and, and that's where, uh, in this kind of thing, they think you don't understand them. The beginning of the conversation, they know what they're going through and they think nobody else really understands how much this is irritating me or nobody understands how afraid that I am of this or, you know, nobody gets them. And so this whole process of being on the same page or them really believing that you understand what's going on with them. When you feed it back, please don't be like some of the NLP people where they just say the same words back to the person. Huh. Really sincerely try to explain back how you're taking what they're saying so that you're on the same page, that you have, they're feeling something and you're knowing exactly what's happening and they're, you're on the same page. They, they will get obnoxiously irritated with you, whether they admit it or not, if all you're doing is repeating the same words they say. Yeah, yeah. I can't stand that technique. No, I don't, I don't like that too. And I see, I see so much of that, you know, with NLP training and it just drives me crazy. And I know people are doing it to me. It's, it's like when you go to hypno thoughts or, you know, when you go to some of these conventions, you know, someone's just picked up some, you know, master Jedi martial art boot camp of language yeah. and then starts to use it on you in the bar. And it's like, I know what you're doing, you know, stop it. <laughs> it is irritating. And, and clients aren't stupid. They, they know what you're doing <laughs> it's not well, you know it's not a mystery I, anymore yeah i 100 percent agree and, and i think that I, I think that the outcome is everything and i think the process is nothing yeah. Yeah. and so we we're talking about process today but remember if you can accomplish it by waving a plunger over their head go yeah. ahead Why like I'm, I'm yeah i'm not in love with this idea that we have to prove we're smart I got a, a quick quick comment from Serena Stone. Good to see you, Serena. Thank you uh, so much for tuning in. I hope you're well. Uh, Serena is, uh, you know, you know Serena. Um, she says it's hard to ask questions. Scott answers them, and Richard leads to them within the flow of the conversation so well. That's awesome. I think that's a little compliment going on right there. That's well, that's perfect. Eight. I think we like to talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we've, we've almost got to got to the end because I know I know people are busy, but I, I've learned a lot, and I hope um, I, I well I not hope I know that uh, other, you know people are watching this and those that are going to watch the replay have uh, have learned something here, and um, we'll monitor the comments for the replay because obviously if you know if, if you're watching this and this is no longer live, uh, let's pop back in the group later on, Scott, if we can, and and uh, maybe answer some of the questions that happen on the replay. Um, one question that I have for you before we go is you have precariously positioned yourself behind a poster that oh, I yeah. believe that we should see. So behind, there we go. Let me go full screen. We've got hum Humphrey Bogart and just tilt it up a bit more. Is that Catherine Hepburn? Yeah, Humphrey Bogart, Catherine Hepburn. Awesome. African that, Queen. That is a French poster of the African queen that I bought in Hollywood from a bookstore. It sat in for many years because we live where the Dora Canal is and they shot the, they <laughs> shot the extra shots and stuff at the Dora Canal. So I like having the movie poster here at the house. Because there's a reason why you use that as your backdrop and it was, it's incumbent upon me to actually ask you about it <laughs> because it's a deliberate well, look. Here's this poster behind me, right? In reality, my my uh, I came home one day and my wife had set all of this up. I was out of town and I came back. I was at my sailboat and I came back and my office had been moved to here. So yeah. actually, it's it's Heather's doing. But uh, 
Nice. Yeah, it's cool. Well, thanks a lot for hanging out and chatting, Richard. I appreciate it. It was it was always a pleasure, sir. And uh, let's. Do, I think we should do this again if we uh, if we get any any questions along these lines. If you, I know you don't mind sharing your wisdom and. Um, yeah, it turns out that we both pay our bills. So, yeah. yeah. And if people yeah. need to get a hold of you privately, can they message you? It, what's the best way? Is it uh, Facebook p private message or something else? It is great. Yeah, Facebook is great. Just PM, just private message? Sure. Great. Cool. All right, All right, so there you go, guys. That was Scott. Um, I'm Richard Barker. And uh, if you want us to do this again and you have any questions or you want us to bring another hypnotist on or into the group, then uh, just message me uh, and just let me know, and I'll, I'll be happy to approach uh, someone else with uh, all the wisdom that Scott has, uh, or Scott again, or someone else, and we'll just do a, a, a Facebook uh, Live into the hypnosis group. We don't really have to have a certain day or time or whatever, because you're going to get the replay anyway. And uh, yeah, I learned a lot, and I think uh, it, it's useful, and I know um, a bunch of you guys out there probably learned something too. So. Scott, thank you so much, my friend. We are getting ready to get out of here. See you, my brother. Have and, fun. And uh, we'll see you next time around. Take care, everyone. See you. Thanks.